But um, thanks to Martin's work on the on, 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 on sort of the that got much deeper in sort of the context of what Heisenberg had been working on before, um, really a lot of things fell into place that you know we had been puzzled about. So this is basically um, telling you how um, what um, Martin's talk was about hooks up with sort of these old questions about how to understand um, um, Heisenberg's. What's that? Oh. Let's see if you are there. Oops. Can you do it? Because I can't bend my neck to this room. Okay. Is it on? Okay. All right. Um, okay, so um, you know the basic problem, right? The famous paper of 1925 um, by Heisenberg has always been difficult to understand. Um, people have always complained about that, you know, um, you don't really understand what Heisenberg was trying to do there. Um, this is a quote that um, um, Michelle and um, Tony bring in their paper about von Vleck that Steven Weinberg complained that he never understood Heisenberg's motivations for the mathematical steps in his paper. Um, and I think, you know, one of the central problems is that because the prehistory was so complex and was like had so many strands, right, a lot of that has been lost. And not just to us, you know, generations later, but even to the actors um, um, when they were, like Heisenberg, interviewed in the 60s, they'd forgotten a lot of that. And um, so I think what you get in this famous interview that Heisenberg had with Kuhn um, is sort of a much reduced story that basically entirely relies on the paper trail that was left and leaves out those you know, harder to remember details like for example these discussions um, um, Heisenberg, Kronig and Pauli had in Copenhagen. And so you then get the, um, this um, simplified structure that sort of um, simplified story that sort of becomes much more monocausal than the um, 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 actual development wars and sort of that tends to stylize the, um, the trajectory into the single Heureka moment which you know in this case is um, you know Heisenberg's trip to Helgeland. Um, so um, in Heisenberg's memory, right, um, the, the theory of dispersion and the um, role of the virtual oscillators they played, and it has the central role in the development of the, of the um, Umdeutung paper. And um, so the basic idea here is, right, that um, that was what um, motivated the replacement of um, these geometrically um, defined electron orbits of the old quantum theory to this um, description of the dynamics that is based on the transition amplitudes. And that's very plausible, right? I mean, of course, um, that was one central step of the, of the Umdeutung paper, that you did not talk about orbits anymore, that you just talked about transition amplitudes. And that definitely connects to this um, image of the um, um, virtual oscillators. But um, what I want to try and show you now is that this is entirely not the whole story. And that to understand, and you know, I'm especially going to concentrate on that famous letter that Heisenberg wrote in um, May of 1925 to Kronig. Um, to understand that letter, you need more than just the story of the virtual oscillators. Um, so yeah, this is basically, by now goes without saying, you've heard enough of that, right? Um, the whole idea of orbits had become problematic by um, 1924. Um, it was like after these initial successes, right, the difficulties started piling up. Um, you had Bond's work, Bond and Heisenberg's work on, on the helium spectrum, which you know gave you entirely wrong um, results. You had the anomalous Seaman effect that um, um, you had all these very complex attempts of, of, of fitting to the orbital model. You had dispersion, you had um, uh, a problem that um, 
Bohr and Heisenberg got into in late 1924, the polarization of fluorescence lights, where you also had to say that, you know, that virtual, if you wanted to tell this story about virtual oscillators, they were actually independent on the um, direction of the incoming radiation and not on the, um, on the actual geometrical um, position of the orbit. So um, there was definitely a willingness to, um, and you know, a willingness very explicitly um, expressed by both Heile, Pauli and Heisenberg, as you've already heard the quotes, right, to say um, we need to somehow let go of those, um, of those orbits. Um, on the other hand, um, the um, correspondence principle um, played this important role especially because there is one obvious lacuna in the Bohr model, right? There is um, nothing in the original formulation of the Bohr model that says anything about the intensity of transitions. And so um, it's not a sort of coincidence or, you know, a, a random um, 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 problem that they also happen to work on the question how to determine the intensities because, of course, the intensities of transitions are measurable, relevant physical quantities and um, um, something had to be said about that. And, of course, the only um, um, instrument you had in the old quantum the theory to say something about the intensities was by this um, 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 arguments from the correspondence principle by somehow analogizing the transitions, um, their intensities, to the um, 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 amplitudes of oscillations in a, in, a, in a classical orbit. And so this is um, how this um, you know, um, formulation that Bohr then sort of canonized in 1923, that you have this correspondence between the um, transition amplitudes in a, in, a, in a quantum theoretical transition to the Fourier elements um, of the of 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 the orbit in um, according to old quantum theory, and you know the original the original application of that was 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 um, in the in the justification of selection rules. That's was that 1918 or 19 when they first said 1916 to 1918 is the yeah. period in which. And um, then um, sort of <coughs> that was generalized into this general statement of analogy, but the general statement of analogy, of course, did not make any numerical predictions, right? It just said there was some relation between the two. Um, and then thirdly, there was the um, um, story of um, um, the search for the quantum theory of dispersion. I'm just going to breeze over that for matters of time. Um, that um, is the relatively well-known part of it, right? The, um, the idea that you have to adapt this relatively successful classical theory of um, dispersion to um, the, um, um, atomic mo the Bohr model, which um, gave you all these problems that you couldn't really explain um, the relation of um, the, the orbital motion of um, um, the electrons to these um, um, oscillations of charges that you needed to explain vibration, that you needed to explain dispersion. And so um, you had to introduce these um, as such oscillators, right, these substitute oscillators um, corresponding to individual transitions. And of course, the amplitudes of these um, 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 substitute oscillators were exactly what corresponded to the transition amplitudes. Um, but as I said, I'm not going to say much more about this. Um, just sort of the formal scheme of this argument, right? Um, you start with the orbit given by the old quantum theory in the bottom left, right? You have these um, um, Fourier transforms of the orbit, right? The, Fourier, the coefficients of the Fourier transform of the orbit. Um, in the classical theory, those would give you um, directly the uh, um, dispersion. But of, in the quantum theory, right, you need to um, translate those via the con correspondence principle in some unknown numerical relation into the Asatz oscillators, and it's those Asatz oscillators that give you the trans um, um, this version. Um, now, there were cases, right, where the correspondence principle actually um, did was able to give you um, exact results. 
And this is sort of this, this um, slogan of the sharpening of the correspondence principles. Um, so um, in the case of multiplet rules, right, you could actually use this correspondence argument plus geometrical arguments to give you unambiguous results. And so this led to this hope that um, um, Heisenberg and Pauli were expressing that you could generalize this schema, that you could somehow develop some general translation rule um, um, that made out of the correspondence principle a general translation scheme from these um, um, classical, um, from the classical um, kinematical description of the atom into a new quantum physical description. And that was um, one of the central motivators of this work uh, that um, um, Martin talked about by Heisenberg, Kronig, and Pauli in the spring of 1925 in Copenhagen, um, where they originally the ambition was to um, apply this idea to the transitions in the hydrogen atom. They realized very quickly that the hydrogen atom was way too complex for, for, to do this successfully. And so they um, um, worked on this toy model of the anharmonic oscillators um, with the idea that if you could get some consistent theory of that, right, then you could generalize it on, um, um, to more complex cases. Um, so here you see it's, 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 it's basically a similar schema. Um, just that the idea here is that um, this arrow between the Fourier transformation of the orbit and the transition amplitudes now is some um, well-defined prescription, not just a mere analogy, but still it's absolutely questionable sort of what explains those transition um, amplitudes um, if there is some deeper quantum theoretical um, theory that can give you the transition amplitudes directly. That's totally not addressed in this work. Um, so the next step, right, after, after this, this um, time together in, 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 in um, Copenhagen, Heisenberg returns to Göttingen and starts to, and, and continues his work on this, these questions. And so then in May 1925, we get this um, um, letter that he writes to Kronich where he describes what he's been doing since. And um, there comes this, you know, well-known quote um, that sort of what he's been thinking about is the basic idea is in the classical theory, knowing the Fourier expansion of the motion is enough to calculate everything, not just the dipole moment and the emission, but also the quadrupole or higher moments of the emitted radiation. Now it suggests itself that also in the quantum theory, everything is given by the knowledge of the transition probabilities or the corresponding amplitudes. So in a way he turns the problem around, right? It's not anymore the question, how do I calculate the transition amplitudes? It's postulating that if I have the transition amplitudes, I know everything else. Um, the example he chooses is rather strange, right? Um, the idea of um, calculating multipole radiation is certainly not the um, 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 issue that was, had any um, um, great practical relevance in the, in the debates at the time. And when on the top of it, the example, you'll see this sketch that he made in the letter. He, he goes on, um, what he actually calculates is in no way um, multipole radiation from the dipole um, moment. But he calculates, oh wait, I'll have a better diagram in the next, see there is a, it is blown up. So what he calculates is the force at a point P in the bottom by some oscillating dipole in the X direction. So you have a um, dipole, you know, there's a negative charge at the say origin and a positive charge that oscillates around it and you calculate the force on the point P, which of course again, has very little to do with the question of dipole or multipole radiation. Plus, it's also not really directly um, um, uh, applicable to the question um, what the quantum theoretical predictions would be. Because, of course, if we now had some new quantum theoretical expression of a force, right, that still wouldn't give us any quantum theoretical expression of what that force does to the particle because presumably, right, that was one of the basic assumptions of quantum theory that um, um, 
particles <coughs> do not react classically on classical forces. So um, the, the, um, this example that, that Heisenberg thinks about is actually rather strange. And um, we've been thinking quite a bit about where that I these ideas could come from. My best guess is that you know, one, one, one um, thing that Heisenberg was aware of <coughs> was that paper that Born wrote in 1924 um, um, about über quantum mechanic, right, where he sort of um, gives his um, um, ideas about where the development of a um, um, new quantum theory was going to go, and where in the introduction he makes this observation that um, we can only formulate a, a, a quantum theory of the interaction of particles if we have um, a correct theory of the interaction between a particle and radiation because the two are in, um, 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 intimately connected. And right, that's basically sort of the step that um, um, Heisenberg is trying to make here, connect the, um, the dynamics of a two-particle interaction to the um, 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 emission of, a, of radiation by a particle. Um, but however that may be, right, it doesn't play any role in the further argument that Heisenberg makes in the letter. It doesn't play a role for the Umdeutung either. So it's, you know, we may be puzzled about it, but it doesn't play a big role for the argument. Um, what he, um, so what he does with the classical example is very simple, right? I mean, he writes down a classical expression for the force, which, by the way, is incorrect, right? Um, um, Kronig points that out when he when, when, when he later published the letter, right? Um, these 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 two terms are actually uh, vectorial quantities, not in the same direction. You can simply add them, but you know, so this this first line is already wrong. Um, but so if we assume now that um, X is given by a Fourier series, right? If X can be developed into a Fourier series, then we can um, uh, also develop K into a Fourier series and express the coefficients of the Fourier series of K by the coefficients of the Fourier series of X. So we get, ter we get expressions like the one I have here in the bottom where the first um, well, the second coefficient, B1, of the Fourier series of K is expressed in terms of these A0, A1, A2 of the Fourier series of X. And that's sort of the general idea, right? We can do always do that in classical mechanics. Um, sort of now have like these, these um, polynomial expressions out of coefficients of the Fourier series of the um, motion of the particle. So what's the um, um, quantum theoretical translation um, uh, of that? Um, there is, of course, once we start thinking about quantum theory, um, things get ambiguous, right? Because the correspondence to um, these Fourier series are now um, these sets of transition amplitudes. Um, A0 is, a is not a transition at all, right? <laughs> A1 is a transition by one um, orbit, A2 is a transition by two orbits, and so on. But none of these are uniquely defined, right? What you have instead in quantum theory are these elements A, I, N, N minus I, right? You have an I, a transition by I steps from the nth orbit to the N minus Ith orbit, right? But of course, you don't know which one of these A, I, N, N minus I you're supposed to enter in these um, expressions. So how can this ambiguity be resolved? And there is um, Heisenberg's um, decisive idea. Um, you introduce this multiplication rule. You require that you only enter those terms, those a i n n minus i, that would combine to a physically possible transition between the um, um, elements now of the B1 on the other side. Um, so if B, say, is from N with a specific N0, right, N0 to N0 minus 1, right, all these A's must combine such that you get a transition from N0 to N0 minus 1. So um, to give you a slightly more um, 
concrete example, right? I mean, so basically it's, a, it's, it's just an application of Ritz's combination principle, thinking of these expressions sort of as expressions of actual transitions in an in a, um, um, atom. So simple possible example, if we um, want to calculate the square of a coefficient, right? Classically, we'd have some expression like um, B2, right, the second Fourier coefficient of, 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 of the function um, times, and that's now important, right, these frequencies that enter, E to the um, 2i o omega t is um, the square of A1 Ei omega t. Um, so obviously, right, the, the frequencies um, um, work out trivially, right? The two, two omega is two omega. Um, but the moment you um, um, think of that in quantum theoretical terms, it's not that simple anymore, right? Because you don't have overtones, right? Omega one, omega two, omega three are not simply a, a, a linear progression anymore. Rather, you have these specific frequencies that are attached to the specific transitions. And so now what you need to require to have the oscillating term, the EI omega t term, on the left and on the right to match, right, is the requirement that the um, transition frequency o omega n n minus 2 on the left be the sum of the transition frequencies um, o n n minus 1 omega n n, n minus 1 n minus 2. Right? And that is simply the Ritz combination principle because, of course, um, the frequencies are proportional to the energies. It just means that the energies need to add up in the right way. Right? And so that means that the coefficients also can only be those that um, are fulfill this rule. So you get um, the translation of the um, multiplication, right? B2 is A1 squared is this specific expression of the um, coefficients in the, in the bottom line. But of course, right, in the classical case, this is a simple al um, um, al um, analytic proof, right, because of course you can require, right, you, these are all elements of a Fourier series and you simply match up the elements with the um, correct um, um, frequencies. So yes, the requirement that the Fourier series are equal determine, um, 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 necessarily determines the fact that these um, um, coefficients have to match up like that. In the quantum theoretical case, we know we don't have a sum. We don't have, an, by stipulation, not an orbit anymore. We don't have these, um, um, these, these um, transition amplitudes do not add up to the description of an orbit. So it is, in that sense, an ad hoc stipulation. But it is, of course, a stipulation justified by an extension of the correspondence principle. You can see it as such case of a sharpening of the correspondence principle. Right? So that's the basic idea. What Heisenberg now applies it to is not to calculate anything from the transition amplitudes, as he said in the original, but return to the previous problem, the intensity problem, right? He calculates the intensity. He observes that he can now, with this um, rule, um, calculate the transition amplitudes from the equation of motion, right? Simply by entering now um, the um, Fourier, uh, Fourier representation of x, of the um, 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 this, um, position of the particle into the equation of motion, and then getting from that a recursive um, representation of these um, um, transition amplitudes. So in the classical case, right, it's again pretty straightforward. You have the equation of motion as, as, as it shows here. You have a um, 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 form of the uh, um, Fourier series that has these lambdas in there um, from perturbation theory, right? It's just assuming that the um, perturbation, uh, that the, the lambda element that introduces the unharmonicity is, is small. You can sort of order these um, 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 series, uh, you can order the series by increasing um, 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 powers of lambda. Um, so, for example, for the first two coefficients, you get some these simple polynomial expressions, and in general, you get some expression 
that the um, tau element, the tau um, factor I, A is um, A1 to the power of tau um, times a uh, um, function of tau. Um, so with a multiplication rule, you can do exactly the same now in the quantum theoretical case. And you get similar expressions that now have, instead of the, um, um, these um, um, factors A1 squared and A1, A2, um, specific combinations of A, N, N minus tau, right? And that's those in the bottom, right? And again, you can sort of give, um, this is a recursive, um, um, this, give, this is a recursive determination of the general A, N, N minus tau, um, which then in general will have this form in the bottom line, right? It will be a, not a simple, um, um, power of A1, but will be a product of A n n minus 1, A n minus 1, n minus 2, and so on, till um, n minus tau plus 1, n minus tau. Um, and that now should look familiar to you, right? Um, if you've seen the end of um, um, Martin's talk, right? Um, that already has a form, right? that um, must have looked familiar to Heisenberg. And um, so we just need one more step, and that step um, Heisenberg simply borrows from their previous work, right? Um, it still hasn't, he still hasn't determined the first step, right? This is purely a recursive um, um, formula, so he still needs the first A1, the A1 n, n minus one, right? And he just again takes that from the theory of the harmonic oscillator um, as this um, 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 proportional to square root of n, and if you put that in, then you get in the end this expression here in the middle. Um, and that's exactly the same um, result that um, Heisenberg, Pauli, and Kronig had um, um, obtained from this um, argument of the vanishing at the edges of the um, um, equation formula by requiring that for the case n, n minus zero and for the case n, n minus one, these amplitudes have to be zero, right? So from that you get, um, again, this, 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 this translation. But now, you know, this, you don't need this additional argument. You don't need a um, um, heuristic argument. You get it entirely from the multiplication rule. And, but of course, the match, right, that you got the same thing from these, that, that these um, calculations that had worked quite well for these intensity calculations of multiplets, um, that was a decisive confirmation of the method. But it's, of course, not yet an answer for the general problem, right? He still has to plug in these assumptions about um, the, um, from the old quantum theory of the harmonic oscillator, right? The fact that the, um, the first um, element of the recursive rule is given by um, this expression that, you know, doesn't come out of his method. Um, so the general idea, though, the schema, um, the, the scheme of the argument is now different, right? He does not anymore um, um, go from the Fourier transformation of the orbit to a set of amplitudes, but he derives from the equations of motions these um, relations between the transitions of amplitudes, and from those can determine the um, transition amplitudes. So basically, right, the argument has now gone a step farther down in the theoretical structure. Um, we're going directly from the equations of motions to relations between transition amplitudes. Um, What's not resolved yet in the Kronig letter is the question of fixing that A1, right? Fixing the constant. And what's also not addressed yet is how the quantum um, condition enters. And, you know, as we'll see in a moment, these two hang closely together, right? Um, that the quantum condition is exactly what can be used to fix the um, first one. But that's obviously something that um, Heisenberg hasn't figured out yet. What's also not clear and what's not going to be resolved for quite a while is what, what this element A0 in the, in the Fourier series is, is supposed to mean, right? That's not a transition amplitude. It means, the, you know, it's, uh, it's something like a transition amplitude between the state and itself, right? And that's going to stay ambiguous for a while. That's only going to be, it's not even going to be really resolved in the Undeutung paper itself. 
And what's also not clear is whether Heisenberg at this point already noticed that um, this multiplication is non-commutative, right? That's going to be something that's going to worry him very soon. Um, and um, what he also very um, liberally fluctuates around with is the question whether these Fourier series are um, real or complex, right? I mean, in his example um, about the squares, right? Here he uses a complex Fourier series, but then when he um, calculates, um, when he talks about the harmonic oscillator, that suddenly becomes a real complex, real um, um, Fourier series, where the phases, of course, don't play a role, right? I mean, he basically drops all the phases. So that's something that's still um, very completely open to. So the next step that we can have a paper trail of is a letter that he writes to Pauli after he was in Helgoland. Okay, I'm almost there. Um, and where he's done basically two, where he's realized two important things. Namely, one, that he can use the schema now to calculate the energy, and that in the case of the unharmonic oscillator, this works out great. Um, the, energy, the, um, for, the energy has a form that Pauli had already sort of derived on general considerations before, so again, it matches previous expectations, and it's conserved, that's, which is definitely a thing that we should have. But what he also realizes in the course of this um, work is that um, the non-commutativity of the um, multiplication gives him a problem to show the conservation of energy in general, right? So that's something he explicitly addresses, that the non-commutativity is worrisome, also for that reason that he cannot generally derive um, energy conservation. And the other one is um, that the, um, he can now use the, um, um, the multiplication um, that he can use a, the quantum condition to um, um, get a set of recursive equations to fix the, these missing constants a1 and n minus 1. And what he uses here is actually not his multiplication rule, but um, this rule that um, um, Born had already generalized in 24 out of the um, dispersion work, right, of translating um, differential um, equations into difference equations. So this is actually um, sort of um, the one point where um, explicitly, um, you know, a non-intensity, something else than the intensity the um, problem calculations comes in, right? But you see that it's sort of distant from um, 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 Heisenberg's thinking because in the letter to Pauli, he doesn't even realize that that is what um, this equation that he's talking about is the Thomas Reiche sum rule, um, but he just sees it as a formal, um, a formal trick how to translate the um, um, quantum condition of old quantum theory into an um, equation for the A ones. Um, and so then he has the um, um, idea, that the last missing constant, right? He still need a, the first A1 um, that you can fix by this idea that there can be no transition out of the ground state into a lower state. And so that basically puts the picture of the Umdeidung um, paper um, in, in place. Um, sort of, I just want to say a couple of things about the Umdeidung paper, right? Um, one thing, this positivistic declaration of the Umdeutung paper is really not something that shows up sort of in the end to justify his calculation scheme, right? But that was really there already from the beginning, not only in the Kronig letter, but also in that work of Heisenberg, Pauli and Kronig in, um, in the spring, right? That um, you need to get rid of the orbits, right? And if you get rid of the orbits, what are you left with? You're left with the transition with the transition intensities originally, and sort of the, 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 the difference between the intensities and the amplitudes, of course, only emerges slowly, right? The second thing that's still unsolved in the, in the undoubting paper is the energy conservation, right? That's still an open problem that Born and Jordan will only solve then in their paper. And um, do you still have this total ambiguity about the Fourier expansions, right? He vacillates between a uh, real Fourier series and uh, complex series, and that of course hangs together with a question that he hasn't really settled yet, whether what he should worry about are the intensities of the emission, which are really the observable quantities, or these amplitudes that of course um, you cannot so simply say that they're observable.
And now, uh, in, in the Umdeutung paper, of course, he has identified the, um, this um, quantum condition with the Thomas Reich, uh, um, Thomas Kuhn's sum rule. Um, but he says it only in a footnote, which makes me suspect, right, that that was something that probably something pointed out to him and that he added in proof, right? So it definitely seems to um, um, tagged on to the text. Um, and another last observation, right, he still seems to think about these sets of ANs not as matrices, right, not as, as two-dimensional arrays, but as vectors, right, as a one-dimensional set of, 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 of coefficients that corresponds to a specific state, namely the nth state of the, of, 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 um, the system. Okay, and then sort of the uh, loose ends get then tightened up in, in, in Maul and Jordan's paper. I'll breeze through that so we'll have a little bit of time for discussion. Um, so just you know, to repeat the punchline, right, um, the, um, I think with this um, story of um, Heisenberg's work on the intensities um, as a background, I think it gets much more um, plausible what Heisenberg is trying to do and how his steps in the Kronich letter and leading to the Umdeutung are motivated. Um, and you know that this work that they did in Kronich, Pauli and Heisenberg in early 1925 was really sort of the most important background to um, 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 the the path to Umdeutung and that dispersion other than Heisenberg later remembered himself was much less central than he thought. Of course, as I already stressed in the beginning, right, I don't, we don't think it's a monocausal story, right? There's all these questions that are around and that play their role, but I think um, you can see, right, the big central issue is these intensity calculations. And also that implies, of course, that the story of this great Hureka moment in, in Helgoland where suddenly everything emerged um, out of nowhere is not really um, 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 tenable either, right? This letter from Kronich is before Helgeland and sort of the basic structure and the basic ideas are already in place. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, usual a bit long. <laughs> No, the anharmonic oscillator is not, not really a problem, right? I think that was basically already decided in the spring of 1925, right? Um, it was the simplest non-trivial model, right? I mean, the, the harmonic oscillator is trivial because you only have the transitions between neighboring states, right? So the anharmonic oscillator is the simplest um, um, model where you have um, all possible transitions, right? And can I maybe uh, you want, finish your question, then I can add yeah. something. Yeah. So because, like, uh, the virtual harmonic oscillators allows Kramers and Heisenberg to sort of explain this version, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then what do you achieve by switching to an, or adding an harmonic oscillator? What did they hope to explain? What kind of spectral series? What kind of uh, sort of, uh, uh, what, what was this about the physical motivation? For that? So no, the but see, that, that, that's the point, right? So the, like the, the problem which, as I pointed out in, the, uh, in my talk is the anharmonic oscillator is empirically non-accessible at, at this point. It doesn't play <clears throat> a huge role. It is a toy model for a situation where you do not have selection rules, as in the case of the simple harmonic oscillator, or for that matter, in the Zeeman effect or the multiplets, which are also simply harmonic. So that's where it comes in. And they are not anharmonic virtual oscillators. The virtual oscillators, as anything, would be the elements in the vectors which, uh, which Christoph pointed out. So, and, and I want to answer, I mean, in the, in the physical model that Heisenberg actually discusses in the Kronich letter, right, um, what we have there is an, an anharmonic oscillation, 
Um, no, a, it doesn't have to be. No, he never talks about what kind of an oscillation it is, right? I think he says it's an anharmonic oscillator. No. Explicitly. Yeah, no, of course. He explicitly says it's an anharmonic oscillator. The one with the radiation, with yeah. the force? Mm -mm. He doesn't. He just says something oscillates. He doesn't never talk about it. He, all he says is it oscillates and the force. I mean, of course, it has to be something more complex than a simple harmonic oscillation, but he never worries about the, the, the description of the oscillation, right? All he, all he says is we have a Fourier series. At, at least in the equation of motion situation, I think it's pretty... Yeah, in the equation of motion, but the equation of motion okay. comes later. I think, okay, I will, I, will, I will not make my point then not to uh, <laughs> instigate more discussion here between the discussions. Sorry. Uh, excuse me, sir. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Perturbatively, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. expansion and right. that, that, that was compared by Hasbro. We had that from the fact that in the energy, right. energy shift of the anharmonic over the harmonic, right? In the order. Right, and I mean, and. So I wasn't yeah. as though there was nothing to check the result. Mm. No, I mean, but you know, of course, the transition, these transition amplitudes, right, I mean, they were purely theoretical, of course, right? But I mean, this, this was not, not empirically um, yeah. proven either. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, but I mean, as, as Christopher and I, as, for, for the transition amplitudes, there was, of course, an old quantum theory result, which uh, is, is the result that, that uh, Heisenberg, Pauli, and Kronig obtained in, in, in um, early 1925. So I mean, that, that was, and that's the first thing he, um, he, um, he confirms there, right? That they obtained the same transition amplitudes in his new, um, in his new mechanics as when one did um, in the um, sharpening at the edges calculation that Martin talked about. And I think therefore, we, I mean, we have to clarify that, that point, but um, if we take that, the, the, the model, the, the oscillating charge in the, um, in the physical model he discusses in that letter is an anharmonic oscillator, that is a case where you have an old quantum theory prediction for the amplitudes and that would then be a natural starting point to see what else you can construct from it, which is, of course, the, the general um, positivistic starting point of constructing everything from the transition amplitudes. I mean, there was also, there was not just the energies, but this, this, this early 1925 result on the amplitude, which was, of course, not, not empirically backed up, but was very much um, meshed up with the, with the whole discussion of the intensities of the Zeeman amplitudes. Okay, so Aaron, oh, okay. Just sorry, for, just for class of clarification. Yeah. Of course, I don't dispute that these calculations of the no, no, transition sure, yeah. amplitudes are from the yeah, yeah, yeah. The no, no, sure, sure. But I mean, I, I, we'll, we'll take a look at it in a moment. Uh, hi. So th thank you very much. I think this is really uh, great work. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about the the calculation. You say uh, Heisenberg made an error in the force. Um, I, I think he's just making an unstated approximation, right? That the a a squared plus x squared is just r. He's making the approximation that a and r are basically the same. X, the relative distance is small, right? So that they're yeah, but of course, if you develop this into a Fourier series, you get actually a different Fourier series, right? If but you if you if you do the um, but, but correct this is, angle. Th this is this calculation, right? Is a is, is a classic example of sort of what you do in electrodynamics to in order to measure right a field strength to make a field observable, right? You place the text, test particle near the dipole, perform exactly this sort of calculation. So I was wondering if you can see, in, in addition to the lineage from the Born paper, which I, I see makes sense, the, the sort of origin of why this calculation, I wonder if, as, as you put the sort of anti-visualization, getting rid of the orbits earlier, before Helgoland, the positivism earlier, I wonder if there's also, this is an influence of the positivism, the idea that what we should be calculating is these sort of measurable, right, physically, uh, uh, easily accessible uh, 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 things. So he, he might not say this is the best calculation that meshes with what my colleagues are debating, but for me, I want something that is sort of commonly or directly perhaps accessible to observation. And so I just wonder if, if perhaps you can see that as well as, as, as an additional uh, continuity in his thought across where you say Certainly. instead it was sort of, it's not nothing and the big eureka, but there's more a continuity here. Yeah, but when, I mean, he's, 
definitely the idea is there of reconstructing all the physics from the Fourier amplitudes or from the transition amplitudes. And he's kind of, this is his best attempt to have a halfway calculable quantity which isn't just a radiation intensity. And um, I don't think the observability per se plays a role here. Um, at this point, I think it's m more the point of finding a quantity that can be reconstructed in a fairly straightforward manner from the um, Fourier coefficients of the motion of some um, atomic toy model. The observability itself, I don't think, is really that relevant here. I mean, he doesn't make much of a point there, and it's not entirely clear what the quantity is he's calculating. I think it's really just the point of having some physical quantity that you can calculate from the Fourier amplitudes in the classical theory. And of course, the requirement is not that the effects be necessarily observed, right? That that force be observable, but that it be um, calculated from the observable transition amplitude. So um, whether that force really needs to be observable is a, is, is a second question, right? That, 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 that wouldn't conflict with the observability requirements. So we have two minutes. If with hi, quick I have a question answer. related to Alexei's. Um, so which is I want to understand better which is the role of anharmonic oscillators in all quantum mechanics. Uh, and, 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 and so my question is related to the role of zero point energy and anharmonic oscillators. Uh, so after Planck's second theory, we have the concept of zero point energy and all that. But so as we just have to, to uh, the energy doesn't change the frequencies right, right, of in the transitions uh, between states. Uh, there are several experimental evidence supporting zero-point energy during the late 1910s and, and early 20s. Uh, but what is considered at that, that time to be the, that, that's the uh, experiment for that, for confirming zero-point energy, was Robert Millikan's measurement of the band of the carbon monoxide in 1924. And for that, he uses anharmonic oscillators. So he, he says that if you, if you, if you, if you write the, the energy of the boron monoxide using anharmonic oscillators, then you have terms that have like n plus half square, and those terms made measurable uh, 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 values in the transition amplitude. So I, what I would like to understand better is which is the role of anharmonic oscillators at that time, and I know that uh, uh, Martin wrote about four second theory, perhaps you, you could so what's the, the what, what experimental course? role of anharmonic oscillators? It seems to me that there is an important role of anharmonic <laughs> oscillators at that time in experimental physics uh, okay. related to quantum mechanics and, and zero-point energy. So, so perhaps that would answer, I don't know, yes. Alexei's question. Yeah. Okay. So just real, just real brief. Um, the Bo I didn't write about the Bohr's the second period. I would never claim that. Um, but as we, n and I can't comment much on the experimental situation, uh, Clayton is the one to, to ask there. Um, but as we know uh, for the story of Heisenberg, um, energy considerations only come in after the fact, as Christoph has rightly has shown, right? It's when he has fixed the intensity scheme business, he starts to worry about the energies, and there he, of course, observes this. Uh, this one and a half, which uh, comes in. But the first concern is really not like a determination of the energy levels, but of the transition amplitudes, right? So the, the, the connection to the energy, um, 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 any um, empirical evidence about the energy level. You have to do that first. You need those. Yeah, but I mean, the, 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 the the aim of the game is pro how to determine the coefficients, right? <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know. The lunch is waiting. Do you have a final? I would like a plea that we extend the session by about 
than the story that you know, Tony and I tell, like has been told before, right? About like it's all like this version, right? And so in that sense, it's very reminiscent of the other big project of the Max Planck Institute called How I Stuff Out the Field Equations, right? Where there is also like, you know, we have Einstein's later <laughs> recollections, and Durgan and I have been arguing over and over and over like, no, like these later recollections are wrong. Mm -hmm. And Rufa Gomez produced this book explaining why it's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, it seems like the Part of the explanation of why it's wrong is that, you know, like these, these interviews with Kuhn, Kuhn is asking extremely leading questions. Well, but actually Kuhn is challenging Heisenberg on that point, right? I mean, he's, he, he makes that point that it's not a very satisfactory explanation. You're shit. Okay. Mm. <laughs> so, I mean, so I, I don't want to, want to get down to quibbles about mm. like, the interpretation of the Kuhn interview, right? But there's a story to tell, there is a story to tell about why, you know, like Heisenberg may have misheard this, that, and the other. Mm. Oh. And so I'm just suggesting may, like these questions may, it may not be, all right? So now the question becomes like how to put all of this uh, back together, mm. right? And so my sense is so uh, that, uh, so in the beginning, right, the story is like, well, there is like multiple rules of major behaviors. And so, yeah, like I'm very happy uh, with that, but I have, to, I have a sense of like where the story stands now that, uh, so you've discovered the new rule that is like been hidden from you, that the new route gets like a little too much emphasis. And that like in fact, like you know, the old story like you know gets a little more right than like the new story suggests. So so the, we're still looking for the balance. And so the question then is like you know so so, so and we've been doing this in general theory. It took like forever to figure this out, right? That once you got the once you feel that you have all the uh, the input, right, in an Einstein's case, because the Einstein edition we have every last scrap that we'll ever get on this, right? So there we can do an exhaustive thing on this. Then like you go back and you identify like things that before when you had the monopausal story didn't make a lot of sense. And now all of a sudden like they fall into place. Mm. Right? And so John Norton came up with this beautiful phrase like you only know when you got it if it passes the chicken scratch rule, maybe that you can explain like every scratch of the page. Right? Mm. And so you've shown like a few things that fall into place quite nicely, but the letter to Rolling, for instance, right? And so this is why I asked, like, Martin, like, you know, like, what about, so there's the later recollections in the interview with Google, uh, uh, but there's also, like, uh, Heisenberg writing enthusiastically to uh, McKinnon saying, yeah, I'm glad you, you, uh, you emphasized this thing that I wrote on the Zaymon effect because I thought that was really important. So how do we think it? Is this also, like, a mis misremember? Uh, you know, like, what, what, is there evidence to nail whether, you know, like, your, 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 uh, uh, Speculation about when exactly did he make the connection to uh, that if you if you umdeut the, uh, the, uh, uh, the the old quantum the, the quantum condition the old quantum theory what you get is the uh, is the uh, is the Thomas Kuhn sum rule you know when that happened right is there I mean like in the case of general relativity as you know we've been bickering about these things forever you know uh, and so John Norton on one hand Jürgen and I on the other so what is the state of play now in this uh, in the in the quantum well, of course, unfortunately, the paper trail is much less rich, right? I mean, that's one problem, right? And I think that's also one reason why why Heisenberg forgets a part of the story is because, you know, these discussions in, in Copenhagen, of course, there's no paper trail, right? I mean, there's there's nothing we have, right? This is, this is speculative, what we're saying. I totally admit for the, to that, right? But we do need, we do know that they worried about the intent, that they had given up on the intensities for the hydrogen and were worried about the in intensities of the unharmonic oscillator. Later. And in the in the Kronich letter, Heisenberg says explicitly about this um, equation here, about the this intensity equation here, which is exactly the um, result we got back in Copenhagen when we were calculating the intensities. So I mean, in 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 that sense, right, we can reconstruct quite a bit. In the case of when he makes the um, contact of the Thomas Kuhn sum rule, right, I mean. All we can say in the Pauli letter, which is June, um, it's not there yet in the, in the submitted manuscript. We don't know. In the published manuscript in September, there's the footnote, right? So the footnote sort of, you know, gives me the suspicion that it was added maybe in proof, but 
of course, I cannot show that. But somewhere between June and September that shows up. What, what I find important for the argument is right that he doesn't say when he writes to Pauli in June, oh, look, this is the result from dispersion theory that you know, I've been thinking about all along. But he says, you know, I can umdoid that equation and get a difference equation with no mention of dispersion theory in the game. Right? I think that is an, is, is, is an important in, um, um, point that in the, when he writes to Pauli, there is no mention of dispersion theory. But of course, all that is not to say that dispersion theory did not play a role. Right? I totally agree with you. It's a, it's a, it's a model. And you know, I think that sort of what, what comes of it, sort of the big picture I'm seeing is that you know, the, these intensity um, um, calculations are sort of the proximate cause, right? I mean, that was what was temporally the closest, right? The dispersion theory was a step before, right? That was definitely what sort of got this whole thinking about the amplitudes and their role going. So in that sense, they were a very important, um, um, important stepping stone, right? But there was this step in between, right, that um, to get from the thinking about amplitudes to sort of the concrete um, 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 steps in the Cornish letter that, you know, you can only explain with the intensity calculations. This is certainly not what we are trying to do. I think in order to get, to make this explicit, right, dispersion theory certainly motivates you to think about amplitudes and transition probabilities. Um, what it does give you is the F sum rule, but it does not give you a formulation of the intensity problem in as a concrete form as you can do with the spectroscopic term schemes, and that's where sort of, where the decisive difference, as I see it, between the two problems is. Both really force you to do this kind of business. Um, yeah. um, okay. I just want to, one, one, one quick comment. We, we, of course, also thought about the other point you addressed about when this uh, shift in, in, in Heisenberg's recollections occurs. Um, that's something we're still thinking about, but one, one, one important drive there is certainly um, a, cond a condensation in Heisenberg's memory onto um, Helgoland and this one, one big switch. I mean, there's a, just an interesting anecdote I mean, um, um, one might want to add is Heisenberg, for example, when he, when he does the, the interview with Kuhn, he hasn't seen the Kronich letter yet. Um, Kronich only digs that out um, somewhat later. And, and communicates it to Heisenberg. And Heisenberg says, oh, that's, that, that, that letter is from early June. That's very interesting. I thought I was in Helgoland later, but then I must have been in Helgoland in late May. So, I mean, it's really, it's, it's quite clear how for Heisenberg it becomes this one, one moment of Umdeutung when in fact you can see it's, it's um, the, the multi-causality, of course, also um, expresses itself in this being several steps of Umdeutung rather than this one switch, which I think is an important thing we want to add, not just the different causes, but the several steps that are um, involved in that process. Okay, so I think we've extended by 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Remember, remember that if you want to